Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Abhijit Singh, and I'm director of at and Cloud Platform. Uh, here I have my colleague from uh, Ericsson work, uh, with me here, and they're going to introduce themselves. Sharad Avinash, please go ahead. Hi, I I'm Sharad Rao. I'm a solution architect in the uh, Ericsson Cloud Platform team, currently working as a network cloud architect in at and designing the at and Network Cloud. Hey, hi, uh, my name is Avinash Shagaventra. Um, I'm Solutions Architect um, in Ericsson, working with at and for uh, designing Network Cloud as a Cloud Solutions Architect. Okay, so uh, today we are going to talk uh, about continuous integration and continuous deployment as a service. Uh, for the agenda, uh, we'll explain why there is a need of CI/CD as a service, the continuous integration, continuous deployment as a service. Uh, what are the typical requirements as a telco uh, we have for uh, CI/CD? Uh, then we will explain the evaluated various continuous integration process flows. Uh, we are going to explain that process flows to you. Same way we are going to do with the continuous deployment process flows. Uh, then, uh, of course, there are many uh, softwares and open source softwares available in the market, and there's some commercial software as well. And how, how do we make choices, choices of a good CI CD as a service? We'll explain some implementation approaches, and then in the end, we will conclude uh, with uh, various topics we talked about and uh, and uh, we'll explain that uh, some best practices, some choices uh, you should make when, when picking a good uh, set of software for your CI CD as a service. Uh, we're not going to go to the next slide. Okay. So uh, like I said, I work for at and and as a telco, we have to meet the promise. We have to meet the promise for 5C software upgrade where we are going to update, upgrade all 5G network functions as truly software-based upgrades. Now, if you look into a typical uh, telco network functions ecosystem, uh, we have um, suppliers, uh, the OEMs, providing many of the network functions. And we have like so so in 5g uh with 3g ppa standard we have like set of network functions each coming from different suppliers now all, now again all these network functions are based are built on cloud native principles and we hope so but but even if it's built on the cloud native principles the the integration the management of this software is a very huge task to talk about the version management, which is typical day zero activity, right? The, the integration with the continuous integration pipelines. Uh, then we talk about the deployment of those uh, applications, bug fixes, troubleshooting, and, and then change management. And then day two, when we go and our operators uh, has to operate those software, patch, manage, deploy, upgrade, all those activities. So, and that's where a good CI CD, a resilient CI CD, a secure CI CD, uh, built on a good cloud native principle, has to be there to build a, and to play a very good role because. That's, that's the foundation. If you don't build a good CI CD as a server, uh, this whole big ecosystem will be very difficult to manage. Uh, we're not going to move to the next slide. Right? So again, I, I'm going to dive into the typical requirements of cloud native CI CD. And now we all are, um, most of us are, uh, I believe, are using a Kubernetes-based orchestrator. And that's where I think the CI CD has to be built, the CI CD system itself has to be built with the cloud native principles. 
And uh, security for all, for telco is very important, and uh, we must protect our customers. And that's where working with Kubernetes, working with various CNCF communities, and, and the framework which we already have, uh, things like role-based access control, things that uh, container security policies, things like network, network uh, policies. We must integrate the CICD system uh, with the um, same set of uh, policies to, to provide a very secure infrastructure. And again, like I mentioned, the day zero, day one, and day two, everything should look like to, to, to have a truly DevOps approach of building this central functions. And, uh, and that's where right? the, the native support of GitOps model that can be tied to each pipeline and workflows with further support for itemized rollback and revision rollback mechanism is, is a must and is required. In addition, uh, there must be a capabilities to perform canary deployments with a given set of posts and on given set of reasons. And last but not the least, uh, we, we work, we, we build networks and with network, the solution must be resilient, uh, must have high availability. And uh, again, like uh, the CICD infrastructure itself, right? uh, it has to be HA, it has to be geo uh, deployed in multiple locations. There should be proper integration uh, between those systems. So in a, that, that was to protect uh, our infrastructure from any a disaster kind of scenarios. So with that, uh, Avinash, and uh, why don't you take us away to the uh, next section and explain the CI processes and uh, CD processes and share us explain various approaches. Thank you, mm -hmm. Avinash, take it away. You are on mute, Avinash. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Abhijit. Uh, so as Abhijit was explaining uh, about the need and the technical requirements, let's dive into some of the some of the typical processes that uh, that a CI/CD environment would uh, would need for such a solution. Right. So here we are looking at from the left side. So you have you have a service provider admin um, and who is actually working to create a manifest of what artifacts would be required per vendor. So this could as well be uh, a vendor admin. Uh, so in, in our typical at and or a service provider environment, there would always be a service provider admin who would, who would actually create a manifest on behalf of the vendors. Um, uh, this could, I, as I said, this could as well be the vendor admin who would be automatically pushing the manifests from their existing um, you know, CI-CD systems or their software delivery uh, uh, units uh, into the, uh, the CI as a service DevOps uh, pipeline. So what this would do is this would prepare the repositories. So you have the content repository and you have the manifest repository uh, that would configure it for each vendor with appropriate paths, appropriate user access, everything. And then once the, the paths and the repository is set up, these repositories will be further set up to actually auto fetch the content that was just approved for pulling. So this auto pull is very much important. So you don't want a human intervention here um, that would that would again slow down the process. So what what technically this this mechanism is achieving is once the manifest is ready on what to pull, uh, this central system would automatically pull in the content that is specified for each vendor and then combine them for a particular release catalog, which we call a V1 alpha. Now, when we go into the next slide, uh, so this is a part two of the C uh, vendor CI and onboarding. So we carry on from where we left off from the previous slide. So here on the left side, you again have the repository uh, repositories which with the content as, uh, as, ter as termed as V1 alpha. So the CI as a service would then has built in preset uh, service provider preset um, jobs like 
security scans. Well, as Abhijit was mentioning, security is a very important detail here. So everything that is coming from the vendor uh, or uh, in-house produced has to go through an industry specified and uh, auditable security scans. So this includes image scans, code scans, um, and uh, manifest scans. So once the scan is complete, and then if there are any manifest changes, so if you actually see uh, inside the inside detail inside the Git path, you would see the Helm charts has various tiers of changes. So a Helm chart uh, for a particular service might uh, might have some global values. Some some may have overridable site values. Some even within the site, every app may behave differently uh, from each region and each site. So all these changes could be applied at this point in time, and a vendor admin who is responsible per uh, vendor software could uh, peer review it, uh, and then trigger, uh, once the peer review is complete, the trigger would go into the CI uh, as a service DevOps pipeline. That would trigger repackage of the incoming software into V2, uh, v, V1 beta. So you, you actually see, so this repository now contains both the V1 alpha and then the V1 beta, so which is the, which is the latest of the software. Now, going further, Um, so once the initial scans and the peer review is complete, you would then move the software into test QA and further, right? So where we left off, again from the left side. So now you have V1 alpha, V1 beta. What happens here is the, C, so the CI, in, in all technicality, the CI as a service is complete. The CD as a service would pick up. This is what Abhijit said when the, about the canary deployments. So it, it is aware of various regions that is preset for it, or it could be defined dynamically. So here I am showing two different regions where there is a region where there is a dev testing done. So there is certain set of uh, preset uh, test cases that needs to be run per software that could be run here. Once that is done, uh, then the QA testing. So this QA testing usually involves end-to-end -end testing. Uh, right, um, and then once the end-to-end -end testing is done, it creates a GA tag on the same release. So that means, uh, a, so given there are multiple feedback loops that has happened, so I'm showing a best case scenario, that's why there is always a V1 alpha, V1 beta, and V1 GA. So in, in reality, it might not be like this, right? So it would be V1 alpha, V10 beta, or V52 GA, because there would have been several revisions of that. So, and then eventually once the GA tag is created, the GA tag uh, release is moved to your production. So if you, are, if you have noticed at the bottom, all of our previous slides, we were working in the pre-production environment at the bottom. Now, once you go to the, once you complete the software test and QA, you eventually want to move the GA tag release into production. So the same content that has now been approved, dev tested, QA tested, Will uh, will move into the content repositories in production. Now, once it is in production, it is actually now ready to actually be deployed in uh, in the production regions. Now, I would uh, hand it over to Sharath, who can speak on how the production deployment would work, uh, and eventually take further into the implementation approaches as well. Hey, Sharath. All right. Th thanks. Thanks, Avinash. So, so now that uh, Savinash mentioned, we got we got a GA tag on a particular piece of software. This implies that it has been appropriately QA tested, and and we are confident that this can be deployed into production. Remember, we don't want to push anything into production unless and uh, until it has been completely tested, right? So, once we get this GA tag, we can now start the continuous deployment as a service phase of the DevOps pipeline. Here, what we can do is we can apply different configs uh, that are required for different production sites. Not all production sites are equal, right? So what we'll do is that, for, uh, for example, in East Coast, we may want it to reach out to uh, the application to reach out to certain things on the East Coast itself in order to minimize latency. If an, if the if the application has been deployed on the West Coast, then we'll reach out to uh, other applications that are deployed on the West Coast itself. So to do some kind of geo redundancy as well, and as well as uh, as well as ensuring that different uh, deployments can actually have different uh, configurations when we are deploying in the production zones. 
uh, any any deployment any cloud native deployment can be deployed in, in not only just uh, local uh, internal uh, production zones but also in public cloud so the deployment pipeline should be capable of doing uh, deployment into various different uh, clouds right and not be tied into a single uh, cloud uh, let us now look at uh, two different implementation approaches that we we are considering in order to satisfy these uh, requirements and the requirements that uh, Abhijit initially set forth. Uh, if you look at the first approach here, uh, uh, here the vendor again still has a control because he has the best knowledge in order to figure out how the his application has to be deployed in, right? So you'll you will have a vendor admin as you can see on the bottom left of the screen. The vendor admin creates uh, appropriate uh, pipelines into uh, using uh, Spinnaker, which is one of the tools that uh, we have selected for this approach, right? He can fetch all the required data based on the tag. Uh, it can be a V1 GA tag or a V52 GA tag, as uh, Avinash was mentioning, and pull it up and create the appropriate pipeline, right, along with the service provider. Uh, Airship is the AT&T or OpenStax uh, uh, cloud building platform, uh, which builds the infrastructure as a service. And in this approach, we are using that to actually uh, create, uh, to actually deploy the uh, software workload in conjunction with, with the Argo CD, right? And here the Argo CD will help us uh, to actually make those uh, small conflict changes that I talked about before for different regions, uh, be it Canary or be it a region on the east or be it a region on the west. So that is uh, one approach for doing the continuous deployment. Uh, we'll now move into the second approach uh, where the concept is similar, but uh, we are using a different tool. Right here, also you have a vendor admin who actually builds the pipeline to deploy his or her their application. Right uh, then, we have uh, one main difference here is the concept of the deploy pod. The deploy pod is a self-contained uh, pod that has got all the details required for deploying that particular application. So the first part is that the vendor would actually help build the pipeline and then utilizing the deploy pod will deploy his workload on uh, appropriate regions, right? Either let it be private cloud or the public cloud regions. Uh, obviously, we are still using Airship as one of the tools, uh, driving tools to build the infrastructure uh, and to push in uh, any Kubernetes uh, clusters that are required. Uh, these are the two different uh, implementation approaches that uh, we are looking at uh, as part of the continuous deployment as a service uh, workload. Avinash. Uh... Yeah, so uh, I think uh, uh, Sharat, uh, you are on mute again. Sorry. So thank you, Sharat Abhijit. So in conclusion, um, CI CD as a service uh, in a multi vendor uh, environment is absolutely a must as Abhijit initially uh, uh, elicited. Um, it's you have multiple vendors, each vendor has their own software delivery process. Uh, you don't want to impede that. So they are best at what they are doing from their own shops. So in to to better uh, and smoothly integrate their software to build a, a, a bigger service. Uh, Uh, Sharat, can you take the rest of the conclusion? Sure. Sorry, yes, as, as, as Avinash was saying, uh, these are the perils of uh, virtual summit and working from home uh, during the pandemic, but uh, I'll continue. So once uh, different software different software vendors know what is best for, uh, on their deployment strategy as well as the integration strategy, and it's very important to understand that uh, we need to push uh, open source tooling so that all the vendors have access to the same set of open source tooling so that they can adopt it and then provide it back not only to the community but also share best practices uh, with us so that we can push it as uh, as a best practices downstream to other uh, vendors as well uh, then uh, thirdly is that uh, 
there are other cicd tools uh, there are plethora of cicd tools that are available but the concept of uh, whatever we are talking about will still remain the same so we are setting up the framework uh, you can plug in different tools but but the concept of our framework will still remain the same uh, avinash yeah th 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 thank sure, you sharad right, abhijit yeah. any yeah go yeah, ahead so, add, add your so just to conclude right um, the i think I, as i mentioned in my opening remarks that um, the cicd is is the foundational and um, as a any cloud native application deployment um, if we have the responsibility uh, we must invest a time in careful selections of those uh, tools, but the, the 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 paramount thing is that number one, uh, I think any tools we choose, it has to be built with uh, the cloud native principles. Uh, number two, uh, we can't compromise or compromise on security and, and the resiliency of the two. At the same time, when you work on the uh, complex ecosystem, complex vendor uh, OEM ecosystem, and there is a lot of flexibility which is desired, which is must to operate. So build the tool, which is adhere with the cloud native principle, uh, which is providing security at the source, then just not compromise. Build it very resilient, use a very well architected service, uh, service oriented architecture principles on this building the tool itself. And last, but not the list, provide uh, flexibility. We call it a structural flexibility, where, uh, yes, there are uh, rules, but, but at the same time, there is a flexibility which allows different network functions to evolve, to, to do their software evolution, upgrades, and things like that. So thank you, everyone, uh, for your time today. And uh, uh, we are open for any Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you, Sharad. Thank you.